So there's an old joke that perhaps you've heard. This joke goes like this, that there was a man walking across a bridge one day, and he saw someone standing on the edge of the bridge about to jump. And the man ran over and said, stop, don't do it. And the person said, well, why shouldn't I? And the man said, well, there's so much to live for. Well, like what? The man said, well, are you religious? And the person said, yes. And the man said, well, me too. Are you Christian or Buddhist or Jewish? And the man said, I'm a Christian. The other guy said, me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? And the one about to jump said, Protestant. And the other guy said, me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? Baptist, came the reply. Wow, me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? <laughs> And the one about the jump said, Baptist Church of God. And the man replied, me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God or are you reformed Baptist Church of God? <laughs> the other one said, reformed Baptist Church of God. And the man said, me too. Are you reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879? Or reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? And the one... About to jump said, Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915. And the guy said, Well, then jump, you heretic, and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Christians have been fighting forever. Some of the most bitter enemies on this planet have been Christians fighting Christians. In fact, it was so deadly in the 16th century, in the early years of the Protestant Reformation, when Christians were killing other Christians all over the place, that one of the foundational books of early Christian history is called Fox's Book of Martyrs, all about those martyred Christians, Christian martyrs martyred by other Christians. Sort of great adventures and missing a point. <laughs> yeah. So it's nothing new from day one. Day one. We have so easily forgotten to keep the main thing, the main thing. Will you pray with me, please? God, our Mother and our Father, we want to love like you, and we want to be like you, but we are human and we are not. And so, how thankful we are. <gasps> that you always keep the main thing, your unconditional and eternal love, the main thing for us, and that you never forget. So God, we ask that during this time of worship, you would teach us, teach us again, teach us anew, how to love like you. And God, may the words of my heart and the meditations of all of us bring joy to you and healing to our world. Amen. 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 So this passage of scripture that Charlie Fredrickson read this morning is from Paul, the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in a city called Corinth. It's one of the very earliest writings in the New Testament. Paul sat down and wrote this letter about the year 52. So roughly about 20 years after Jesus walked this earth with the disciples. Just 20 years, 20 little years, and already the church was losing its way, especially the congregation in Corinth. Now this church in Corinth was one of the very first churches, and it was a mess already. To be fair, it had an uphill battle because this church was in a city that was a very complex locale with a very complex population of people. It was a thriving port city. Probably at least a dozen languages were spoken there in addition to Greek and Latin. And there were multitudes of all kinds of religions there, temples and shrines all over the place. And maybe what was going on externally outside the church contributed to what was going on internally because it was just such a complex mix. We'll never know for sure what the outside problems were at the church in Corinth that were contributing to the internal pressures. But we do know this for sure, and we know it from Paul's letter, that right out of the gate, this church was in trouble. There were class divisions, people in the congregation with different levels of wealth and power in the society. There were theological bat battles. Was it okay to marry? I mean, forget gay marriage. It was just, is it okay for anyone to marry? 
Which spiritual gifts are most important? Who gets to do things like consecrate communion and read scripture? Who doesn't? Boy, we've never had that one, have we? <laughs> and what we hear about today in this particular passage is about power struggles. This is where all the energy in the church was going. Power struggles, egos running rampant, theological bickering, folks more invested in following their favorite pastor than somebody else's favorite pastor. If the church had had an answering machine, this would have been their outgoing message. Beep. Thank you for calling First NCC of Corinth. No one is available to take your call because we're in the middle of a big fight right now. <laughs> Leave your name and number and the winner will get back to you as soon as possible. <laughs> Beep. <laughs> Author Stephen Covey says this. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the church at Corinth had forgotten if it ever really ever knew it at all what their main thing was supposed to be. And we can tell because of what Paul wrote. He said, it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. And what I mean is that each of you says, well, I belong to Paul, and my favorite is Apollos. No, my favorite is Cephas, also known as Simon Peter. Well, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul, myself, was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in my name? And then poor Apostle Paul, you can just tell he's walking on eggshells here. I thank God I baptized none of you except these two people over here, Crispus and Gaius, you know, so that no, no of you will cook, you know, brag that you were baptized in my name. And then you can tell he's sitting there thinking, oh dear, whoops. Okay, I baptized people in the household of Stephanus. Stephanus is going to be really bad. Okay, I did also baptize the household of Stephanus. But beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. You ever walked on eggshells like that in a group? Either at work or at a church? Oh, no, forget to mention that person. They'll get really upset. Then you know what's going to happen then. But Paul is saying, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who baptized you. That is not the main thing. So then what is the main thing? Well, all we have to do to answer that question is to go back to the first verse in the passage that says this. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And right there in those words, we have both the diagnosis to the problem and the solution to the problem. The diagnosis was this. The people of the church in Corinth were claiming other people's names as their identity. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. yeah. They were claiming other people's names and behaviors as their identity. That's the diagnosis of the problem. Here's the solution. They needed to be united in their common identity Instead of treating other people according to that identity they had from someone else, they needed to be unified in their identity in Christ. Claiming the name of Christ. That might be a little problematic for us in this room. Yes? Such horrible things have been said about LGBTQ people and our allies under the name of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? It can be really hard for us to actually embrace that name, can it not? But folks, we've got to remember Jesus Christ was not the one who ever condemned homosexuality. Ever. He loved to hang out with the sexual outlaws of his day and was routinely denounced for it. Here is the sum total of what Jesus had to say, what he said was more important than anything else. Love God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's it. That's everything. He gave his life for that message. And this is the identity, the message, the message of the cross. This is the main 
thing that we must keep the main thing. Jesus was willing to die, to literally lose his life, to show us what sacrificial love looks like. What it means to love your neighbor, even when they don't love you back. It's easy to love anybody when they love you back, right? Yes. When they don't love us back, that's when the rubber hits the road. He gave everything so that others could live. Because living in this way, loving your neighbor as yourself, is the only life worth living. And Jesus died for that message. This is the message of the cross. This is the gospel that Paul said we must be united under. This is the main thing. It doesn't mean we have to give up our differences or our uniquenesses. We are attached to our uniquenesses, are we not? Yes. Doesn't mean we have to all have the same opinion politically. Doesn't mean we have to have the same opinion about anything. Or two or three are gathered, there shouldn't be a fight. <laughs> we just can't confuse all of that stuff with our identity as followers of Jesus and let that identity dictate how we treat others because that is the main thing. So why am I preaching this? Other than the fact that the scripture and the lectionary fell on the Sunday. <laughs> is our church like the one in Corinth? Is it being torn asunder? I don't think so. I mean, we have our struggles like every church, but I don't think we're the church in Corinth by any means. But can I get a witness that in this day and age, the danger is there? Oh, yeah. Amen. We probably have some rough times ahead. And I get a witness to that. We are going to want to argue like the church in Corinth. Well, I belong to Trump. Well, I belong to Hillary. I belong to Black Lives Matter. I belong to the police. Well, I belong to the women marching in the streets. No, I belong to the pro-life groups. I belong to the Republicans. Well, the Democrats are better, and I belong to them. And any of those things might be true, but none of them are the main not here. The main thing, we belong to Christ, the one who gave his life for the liberation of all of us. Amen. So, it's true. We know what the main thing is. But what does that really mean? We might know what it means in the abstract. It's a lovely thing to say, I guess I follow Jesus. I know what the main thing is. But in the day-to-day interactions with others in life, in the day-to-day -day sitting down at the computer and typing the words on Facebook, in the day-to-day -day reading of the news, it's a very different thing, isn't it? What does it mean to keep the main thing the main thing? It all comes down to how we treat one another. Because what we do here, in here, determines everything about the integrity with which we live out there. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are to treat one another as we want to be treated. With dignity, with respect, with kindness, with love. That doesn't mean we will not disagree. We absolutely will. That's a healthy church. But we must find common ground in the name of Jesus Christ and embrace that name of pride and not let anyone take that away from us. I'll close with this story. <clears throat> right at about 50 years ago now, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached a sermon called The Drum Major Instinct at Ebenezer Baptist Church. I try not to read this word for word because certainly read it, wrote it better than I can read it. But he told this story in his sermon. He said, the other day, I was saying, because we always try to do a little converting in jail. And Dr. King spent a great deal of time in jail. He was arrested 30 times in his time as an activist, as a religious leader. He said, when we were in jail in Birmingham the other day, the white wardens and all the jailers, they enjoyed coming down to talk 
with me about the race problem. And they were talking, and because he wasn't by himself, he was with others as well. He said, they were showing us where we were so wrong with our demonstrating, and they were showing us how segregation was so right. And they were showing us why intermarriage was just so wrong. So I, I got to preaching, and we would get to talking calmly, which I thought was interesting. As he said, you know, they wanted to talk about it. And then he says, we got down to the real point. I think it was on the second or third day that I was there. We started talking about where they lived and how much they were earning. And I said, you know what? You want to be marching with us. You're just as poor as we are. <laughs> and I said, you were put in the position of supporting your oppressor because through prejudice and blindness, you fail to see that the same forces that are oppressing white people in American society are oppressing poor white people as well. And all you are living on the satisfaction of your skin being white. And of thinking that you are probably somebody big because you are white. And you're so poor you can't send your kids to school. You want to be out here marching with every one of us every time we have a march. Now, Dr. King had never listened, had never engaged them. That conversation, that truth, never would have come out. He listened to them for at least two days, maybe three, in jail. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. I was only arrested one time for a marriage equality demonstration in San Francisco. I spent about four hours downtown. And let me tell you, it's a long time. <laughs> When you have nowhere private to go to the bathroom, it's a long time. And he was there for two, maybe three days, just listening to the very ones who arrested him. And I cannot imagine that those jailers were not forever changed. I wish I could have found detail. I looked and looked trying to find their story, their reaction, but I couldn't. But I cannot imagine. They were not forever changed. Because he was willing to listen, to treat them with respect, even as he was being so terribly, terribly disrespected. He was willing to give his life away so that others, his very enemies, could live a better life. He repeatedly said, this is work for human rights. That poverty will be destroyed. Not any one group. He gave away his life so that others, even those who hated his guts, could live. Ironically, he preached this sermon about two months before he was assassinated. And he closed this sermon with these words that he said he hoped someone someday would share for his eulogy. He said, I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. Surely if Martin Luther King Jr. could say this, that his main thing was to love others outside of the church, people who hated him and everything he stood for, if he could love them, then surely we can start loving one another within the church, even when we are vehemently opposed to one another. Yes. Keeping the main thing, the main thing, so that we can find our common ground and go out and take that way of being out into the world. It won't be easy. Nothing worth fighting for ever is. If I ever have the chance, if we ever have the chance, to be, I hope I'll be kind to him. <laughs> I know Sarah Helen will be. He won't know what to do with her. <laughs> I hope we invite him into the parsonage so he can see that our life is not miserable or filthy. Parsonage might not be as tidy as I was about to say. <laughs> 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 but 
But I hope we'll have him to dinner and I'll hope we'll just listen because that poor man, that poor, poor man, I hope that because we are followers of Jesus, that we will not forget that that is our true identity. And loving in that way is the only main thing that's going to save our world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen.